Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the August 31st meeting of the Menlo Park Environmental Quality Commission. Today uh, we're having a special meeting. It's off cycle from our regularly scheduled uh, third Wednesday. And so as a special meeting, we don't have uh, initial public comment at the start of the meeting. There will be public comment opportunities on our different uh, regular business items. So the public can comment on those uh, when we get to each of those items. So um, sustainability manager Lucky, could you call the meeting to order? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Cabot. So at this time, we do ask that the members of the EQC remain on screen for the duration of the meeting. You'll be able to control your own webcams and microphones and staff will engage webcams and microphones to make presentations or to respond to members of the EQC. And for members of the public who are in attendance and wish to provide public comment on any of the agenda items, after the chair calls for public comment on the item you wish to speak on, please engage the raised hand feature. It's typically next to your name. I'll have the ability to open your microphone and you can provide public comment to the commission. For those who are calling in from a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine to raise your virtual hand. And um, this concludes the meeting, or not the meeting, <laughs> we're not nearly there at all, uh, concludes instructions. Um, and we'll proceed to row call as well, Chair Cabot, if that's okay with you. Yes, please. Okay, so Commissioner Elkins? Present. Commissioner Evans? Present. Commissioner Headley? Present. I'm sorry, Vice Chair Headley. Um, Chair Cabot? Present. Uh, Commissioner Lynn? Present. Commissioner London informed me that she will not be unable to attend tonight. Um, and Commissioner Schmidt? Present. Okay, thank you so much. We continue, Chair Cabot. All right. Uh, thank you. So at this point, we would go to our regular business and item C1 is to approve the minutes of our last July 20th uh, Environmental Quality Commission meeting. So we've got those minutes attached to the agenda. And so hopefully everyone's had a chance to take a look at them. Uh, does anybody have any corrections at this time that they'd like to suggest to the minutes? Okay, and seeing none, then we can put it open for public comments. If there are any public comments about the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, Chair Cabot. So again, if if there's any members of the public who are in attendance and want to provide input on approving the July 20th, 2022 Environmental Quality Commission meeting minutes, please use the raised hand feature next to your name, or if you're on a landline or cell phone, press star nine. Give a few seconds on that. Do not see any hands raised at this time. You may continue with the agenda item, Chair Cabot. All right, thank you. So, so is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. Okay. I'll and is that. there a second? I'll second it. All right. So moved by Commissioner Elkins, second by Commissioner Evans. I'll take roll call to approve the July 20th, 2022 minutes. Commissioner Elkins? Aye. Commissioner Evans? Aye. Commissioner Headley? Vice Chair Headley? Aye. Chair Cabot? Aye. Commissioner Lynn? Aye. And Commissioner Schmidt? Motion passes. Thank you. All right, thank you. So that brings us to item C2, which is to consider the recommendation from staff to the city council 
on the upcoming city vehicle and equipment purchases. And there is a, an attached staff report. And so is there a staff presentation on item C2? Yes, there is. Um, just give me a minute to promote um, the team to provide the presentation here. Sorry, it's just taking a minute. So for members of the public, what we'll have is the staff will make a presentation that commission members may have clarifying questions about items just to make sure we understand it, then it will be open to public comment. And then we'll have uh, further commissioner discussion. Thanks. And it's my pleasure to introduce um, management analyst Joanna Chen. She has been the pen holder on this report and coordinating between various departments on the vehicle purchase and adhering to multiple city policies and um, analysis on kind of our equipment for public works um, and the general operations of the city. And so she'll be presenting. And with that, you can take it away, Ms. Chen. Great. Thanks, Rebecca, for the introduction. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. And then mm -hmm. can I get a verbal confirmation yes, that you're able it. to see this? Okay, uh, yes, great. we see it. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so good evening, Chair Cabot and members of the EQC. I'm jo Joanna Chen, the Management Analyst for Public Works. I'm here to present the upcoming uh, vehicle and equipment purchase, and the EQC's role is to consider a recommendation to the City Council. Here with me tonight, we have Brian Henry, the Assistant Public Works Director, Rebecca Lucky, the Sustainability Manager, uh, Dave North, the Chief of Police, and Don Weber, the Fleet uh, Supervisor. Um, I also want to do a special shout out to the remaining team. They helped build this purchase uh, proposal together, um, and unfortunately, they weren't they aren't available for tonight. But just a special shout out to these members or these team members: William Dixon, who is the Police Commander; Nikki Nagaya, Public Works Director; Scott McDan, the Admin Sergeant; T.J. Moffitt the police commander or an orb has the management analyst for sustainability. Um, and I wanted to provide some background information on the vehicle equipment purchases. They are based on mileage, age, downtime for repairs, and the mandated emission regulations. The purchases adhere to the city's Climate Action Plan goal number five, which is to eliminate fossil fuels from city operations by 2030. The city's vehicle, fleet vehicle, is the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in city operations. The purchases also adhere to the sustainable fleet policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by reducing, or sorry, by increasing the number of zero emission vehicles. Before we go into this upcoming purchase, I just want to provide a quick update on last year's vehicle, police vehicle purchase. Um, and so the police department or the city embarked on a strategic EV transition, especially in the PD and the police department. Um, we were able to purchase three Tesla Ys to pilot in the patrol fleet, one Ford Mustang Mach-E in the admin fleet, and one Chevy Volt, which will soon be uh, deployed for code enforcement. And so this, uh, this marks as a major milestone for such a small size police department. Uh, the Menlo Park Police EV uh, ratio is actually greater when you compare it to other similar size departments in the region. Um, 
So speaking of Tesla, staff has started to brainstorm on how to implement on the Tesla pilot program. Uh, several factors to consider and to test in the program is that the patrol vehicles are driven very differently from an average commuter vehicles. They are used 24 seven a week to respond to calls for services. One, for example, a full battery charge would be required before um, an officer starts and ends their shift as anything can happen on their job. Other factors to consider is the battery drain uh, throughout the day and the additional weight um, from the modification of the vehicle. For instance, the ballistic panels on the Tesla Y, it added an additional 120 pounds to the vehicle. And then you also have to consider the, the other necessary um, and important police equipment that needs to be installed in addition to those ballistic panels. And then also considering the amount of time to fully charge those batteries. Um, the exciting news, or and in addition to what's on the slide, ORIPAS did write a memo, which is attached to the staff report, uh, which provides a more detail on, um, on what will occur during the pilot program. Uh, so the exciting news is that the three Tesla Ys will be, uh, should be service ready by November. And so the proposed vehicle vehicle purchase for the police. We have three detectives vans that are currently hybrids and um, which will be replaced by electric alternatives. One pool sedan that is currently gas, they will be replaced by electric alternatives. One community service truck that is currently gas, uh, planned to be replaced by an electric version. Two traffic enforcement motorcycles, these are currently electric, but we propose to, um, to replace them with a lower emission gasoline motorcycle as electric options are currently not viable for uh, the traffic officer's uh, operation needs. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. So the police department currently has two electric motorcycles, a model 2014 as well as a model 16. These, the manufacturer is called Zero Motorcycles. So they are one of the first motorcycles to make an all electric motorcycle and configure them into, uh, into police operations. But during the usage of these motorcycles, uh, the police department has experienced some limitations with these. For instance, the replacement batteries are no longer available for the 2014 Zero model. Uh, during while on duty, the officers have experienced some malfunctioning, uh, malfunctioning electric circuits while driving the 2016 model, which is a safety concern. Uh, staff is unable to maintain and repair these bikes on site due to prepare, pre, pre, <laughs> uh, due to the property um, that they own. So we have to outsource those um, repairs offsite. Um, and then overall, these motorcycles do, do not meet traffic patrol operation needs uh, for hands-free communication and road speed due to safety concerns. And so this is why we believe that lower emission gasoline motorcycle replacements are a better option uh, currently. Uh, because these motorcycles have better fuel economy than the previous gas motorcycle models. Uh, the replacements would, uh, would significantly reduce vehicle emissions compared to the Harley motorcycles that they would replace. And uh, the BMWs would also have adequate space to install all necessary police equipment to operate safely. So in addition to the patrol vehicles, the department does uh, use bicycles as a way of alternative transportation. So the police have a total of 15 motorcycles, which includes two e-bikes. The benefits of those e-bikes is to cover more ground more quickly during pursuits, have more community engagement, and to conserve energy while engaging with suspects. And so we move on to the proposed vehicle uh, equipment purchase for public works. So we have three light duty trucks that are currently gasoline. We um, intend to replace them with a similar EV um, alternative. 
and then we have five large equipment that are cur currently being used um, with renewable diesel, and they will be replaced with also be replaced with renewable diesel uh, similar equipment as there are no current elect uh, electric options on the market right now. So those uh, vehicles. Those equipments have an average age of 15.5 um, years. And so you'll see the, the roller, which is to help pave and make repairs to the, to the roadways. We have the grinder, which assists in tree removals. So it helps grind up the, the roots and the stumps of dead trees. Then we have the brush chipper, which is to clear wood debris and converts that into mulch to be spread in medians and parks to reduce the growth of uh, weeds. Then we have the farm tractor, um, which is to help renovate sports fields and activity fields. Um, for example, to help spread the seeds and a fertilizer. And then lastly, we have the mower, which is to groom or to cut the grass in, um, in the sports field. And so just to conclude this summary or this presentation, staff is recommending that the ETC consider a recommendation to the city council on the upcoming uh, city vehicle and equipment purchases. Um, and so we have a list right here. So that would be three electric sedans for the police detective unit, one electric sedan for the police pool, one electric truck for the police community services unit, two lower emission gasoline traffic enforcement motorcycle, three electric light duty public work trucks, and five renewable diesel powered pieces of equipment. Um, and so as of August 24th, the estimated cost of all these purchases uh, would be $1 million. Um, we do want to note that the quote that we received, it will, we expect that it would increase um, by the time it goes in front of city council. And so that concludes the presentation. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chen. And so at, at this point, I, I'd like to uh, find out if uh, any commissioners have any clarifying questions for staff. Uh, yes, Chair uh, or Commissioner Evans. <laughs> um, thank you, Joanna, for doing all of that analysis and putting together that very clear presentation. Much appreciated. Um, I, just two clarifying questions. Um, one, um, so we're looking at two electric motorcycles for the police department. You did mention on one of the slides that the lower emission gas motorcycles are more fuel efficient than the Harley alternatives, but 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 the switch off that we're considering making is going from two current electric ones to two gasoline ones. Is that correct? I wasn't sure that I understood the Harley piece. That was question number one. And then question number two was, um, did staff um, analyze alternative electric motorcycle brands? It sounds like there were challenges with the current brands that were employed by the police department. And I'm curious if since then, if more reputable um, well-reviewed brands have emerged and if those were analyzed. Thank you. I'm, I'm ready and prepared. If, you, if you'd like me to uh, start in now or do I need to be? What? See, I'm, I'm thinking, I, actually, I'm thinking that didn't sound like a clarifying question about what was in the presentation. Uh, it, it sounds like the type of substantive discussion that we need to get into. Perhaps the second one. Uh, um, the first one, though, was clarifying. I was trying to figure out there was a slide that says that the gasoline motorcycles were more efficient than the Harleys. Are the Harleys the electric ones? That was a part I didn't understand. Happy to answer that to, to yeah. the chair if, if, uh, if that. Yes, yes thank, thank you. you. 
So uh, thank you, Commissioner uh, Evans, for the question. Dave Norris, Chief of Police for Menlo Park PD. And and I, I hate to do this, but I'd like to ask you if you could rephrase it only because they promoted me as a panelist right in the middle of your question. So I missed a piece of it. Um, That's I, okay. I most of it, but if you could just repeat it so I can make sure I'm thorough with you. No problem. My first, my first and, and perhaps only question, because it sounds like my second one fits into the next piece of our discussion in a better way. Thank you. Um, the, the one of the slides said that the two proposed um, higher fuel standard. Um, sorry, I'm not being articulate at the moment. Let me rephrase that. Um, one of the slides said that the two gasoline motorcycles that are being proposed are more efficient than the Harley models, but the but the proposal on the table is to replace two existing electric motorcycles with two gas powered motorcycles. Is that correct? I just didn't understand the comparison to the Harley and how that played into the thinking. So uh, I, I can give you, there's a little bit of a shuffle involved in that, um, only only because we know that the, that the two existing electric motorcycles are in a state of disrepair that we will not be able to recover them from and put them back on the street, one. And secondly, uh, they, they also are the, the type of motorcycles that we cannot use for traffic enforcement, which is what currently the Harleys are being used for. So the two Harley Davidson motorcycles are being used by our traffic officers. Um, the difference being that the zero bikes are more designed for trail work, um, off-roading type activity, small uh, you know neighborhood type of driving, but not designed to um, pop out into traffic, chase down a, a vehicle, um, you know code violator and get them stopped um, or to be interoperable with the rest of patrol uh, because they can't have an integrated radio. And so um, so we're phasing those electric motorcycles out. We would like to get as green as possible with, with our motorcycles that are in patrol for traffic enforcement. And that's the reason behind moving to BMWs. So we will be replacing, we currently are are operating three Harley Davidson motorcycles on the road for our three traffic officers who are currently assigned to traffic enforcement. We're gonna be replacing two of those with the BMWs. So the difference being that the Harleys are all gas powered. They're all very heavy emissions comparatively for motorcycles. The BMWs are required to be manufactured to uh, what they call Euro 5 standards which uh, in, in Europe, they, they can't even sell Harleys anymore because of the emissions that come out of the Harley motorcycles. The, the European manufactured bikes have a vastly and significantly uh, lower uh, uh, carbon footprint than, than the Harleys. And so we're looking to swap out two of those BMWs. And I can tell you that our traffic officers are all for it. And in fact, if we can find a way to swap out the third Harley, for another BMW, we will do it in a heartbeat. Um, they are, uh, they're designed for patrol. They are significantly lower emissions. We currently don't have an electric motorcycle option that works for our uh, patrol traffic enforcement team. Um, those, the only motorcycle that's currently being uh, made uh, and, and Harley Davidson actually sold their live wire line. Um, but the, the only one that was being sold was that live wire edition of the, the Harley Davidson line that's now its own independent uh, line. And that that vehicle is not suitable to be converted uh, or retrofitted for police patrol. It's not designed for that purpose. And so we are eagerly watching the market. Uh, but in the meantime, we really wanna reduce our carbon footprint and we wanna bring in uh, vehicles that, that will show that we are continuing to move. As you know, Menlo Park PD wants to move in that direction, that we're continuing to move in that direction. And so that's, that's the impetus behind the BMWs. We have two zero vehicles that we can take off of our numbers and we can add the, uh, the, the BMW vehicles on. Uh, we're hoping to you know, ultimately phase out the Harleys. They have good resale value, phase them out, uh, get them either sold or use them as practice motorcycles uh, as as our officers are getting ready for you know potentially motor qualifying school um, which can really beat up those bikes so we want you know the bikes that are kind of on the tail end of their of their life to be the ones that we're using for those practice runs and so we we intend to kind of rotate those off until they they naturally fall off of our total numbers and we're all for adding 
additional BMWs as soon as we're able to do so. All right, all right. Thank you, Chief Norris. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Elkins, do you have a clarifying question? Uh, thank you, Chair Cabot. I'll let you decide whether this is clarifying or needs to go into the next uh, section. But my question is uh, a bit more of a foundational question, I guess. I'm, I'm interested in finding out more about the differences between diesel fuels, renewable diesel, biodiesel, and just petroleum-based diesel. Um, that's not something that I have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about. So I, I'd like to hear more about that. And so if that's more appropriate for the next section, that's fine, Chair Cabot. Uh, yeah, to me, that does sound substantive. And, okay. and so if, if we can uh, check in on any further clarifying <laughs> questions about uh, what the material presented meant. Yep, and Commissioner Schmidt. Um, uh, thanks, Chair Kevin. Uh, I, I may have missed this, but I caught the, um, the life cycle of the heavy equipment at 15.5 years. Um, but I wasn't sure if I caught the life cycle of the replacement motorcycles. It, it might have been presented and I just didn't hear it, but I was curious, um, uh, Chief Norris, uh, if, if you guys had an estimate of what the life cycle of these replacement bikes would be. I'm not sure on the Harleys, and I know that, that Brian Henry is also available potentially to help with that, um, or I may be able to pop out and get that answer very quickly for you. Um, I do know with the BMWs that we're rotating in, um, they're on about a five-year life cycle, but typically speaking in, in terms of police vehicles, the motorcycles have the highest resale value. So being able to, like, let's say we get two and a half years down the line and all of a sudden there are incredible electric motorcycle options. Our traffic officers are really excited about the idea of getting to electric motorcycles when they're available for our police officers. So if that moment were to come, then we might be able to come back and, you know, work something out or figure out a way to, um, to transition and, and or, you know, just pilot um, electric motorcycles and try and get into that um, into that side of it. And, and there's, a, there's an option for, you know, a high resale value for motorcycles if we needed to kind of try and make that happen quicker. I think there are ways to make that happen quicker. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, I think that addresses probably even the longer conversation. I was worried about a 20-year service life and we, you know, we'd be committing to being that way for a long time. So thank, that was a perfect answer. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And so at this point, the uh, uh, sustainability manager, Lucky, if you're able to call for any public comment. Thank you, Chair Cabot. So at this time, for members of the public who are in, attest in attendance, if you'd like to make a public comment regarding the proposed um, vehicle and heavy duty equipment um, purchase, please use the raised hand feature that's usually next to your name or at the bottom of the screen. I'll be able to unmute your microphone. Um, and you'll be able to address the commission for up to three minutes. If you're on a landline, you can just press star nine and I'll be able to see your hand raised. And with that, it does look like we have a hand raised. Let me get our timer started here too. So, Ali Agassin, I have unmuted you. I think you may need to unmute your microphone to be able to speak to the commission. Thank you. Hello, commission and uh, police chief. I just wanted to make a brief comment on the uh, potential resale of the motorcycles five years down the line when uh, an electric option becomes apparent. I just want to note that resale doesn't really eliminate the emissions from these motorcycles. It merely shifts them to the purchaser of the motorcycles and they'll probably continue to drive around in the Bay Area or in the country for another 15 years after the resale. The question is really, can we avoid popping two more gas powered motorcycles out of the manufacturing facility at this point? Thank you.
Thank you for your public comment. Any last call for making public comment on this agenda item? And I do not see any hands raised at this time. I return the meeting back to you, Chair Cabot. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Augustin for the, the comment. And uh, thank you, Steph and uh, Chief Norris for the for presenting the information thus far. So now I'd like to open it up for commissioner discussion of uh, the proposal and the implications and any type of recommendation, you know, moving towards any type of recommendation we would like to make to the city council. So uh, any comments from commissioners? All right, and I see uh, commissioner Evans. I didn't mean to go first yet again, <laughs> but yet here I am. Okay, anyways, thank you. I'll keep mine quick. Um, I actually did some relatively quick Google searches on electric tractors. Um, and I, I would love to hear from, from Public Works if it's viable. Um, I'm seeing the slide said no electric ones um, available or feasible. But, I, but I'm actually seeing um, a bunch of brands pop up just with a basic Google search. And, and so I was curious the extent to which they'd been analyzed. One has a brand name um, that's a little bit hard to pronounce, but um, Solectrack, S-O-L-E-C-T-R-A-C. -E and I just spent, it has two different models. One is a compact one that, that is recommended for um, using the tractor on turf, which is our intended purpose. Um, and when I scroll down on the website, I'm seeing that it looks like in the state of California, there's a sort of government movement to try to get municipalities to adopt electric tractors now. And I'm seeing that um, as of July 2022, it says California businesses and government agencies can apply for an incentive voucher. The California Air Resources Board also offers two main incentive programs. So it sounds like there might and also when I'm looking at the base price of this E25, I think it's called, um, it, it, it's noteworthy to me that it's much cheaper potentially than the tractor that is listed in the attachment to our commission report, which I think was listed at 50,000. Um, and this is just one brand that's popping up. And so I just would love to hear um, Public Works thoughts or, or Joanna's thoughts on, you know, have these, have these tractors um, been analyzed for our purposes? Thank you. There I am. Oh, great. Um, so yes, I could definitely answer that question. And that was one of the manufacturers that uh, the fleet supervisor, Don Weber, and I did reach out to them about uh, those specific models. Um, so when we started our research, we did find that Soul Track did have a similar model that would meet the city needs, but unfortunately they discontinued that one. Um, and then the compact model that you had mentioned, it, it doesn't fit to our needs because I, I believe the horsepower is a little bit lower than what we typically use. Um, and we we are continuing to research other other similar manufacturers. I believe there's one called Monarch that we're slowly looking into. Um, so these tractors are on our radar. It's just uh, making sure that the model that they're proposing meets our city operation needs. All right. Thank you. Thank and you, Joanna. And Commissioner Schmidt. Um, yeah, I, I guess um, I had a question and a concern. Um, the question is more about uh, also on the equipment. So of everything I heard, the motorcycle discussion, uh, because the service life is, is fairly low and the resale value is high, you know, that that feels that feels better than a 15.5 year service life and we're committing to gas consumption for almost two decades. Um, so I guess 
that's my my comment. Uh, my question is, uh, why purchase these now? Uh, I mean, uh, from the pictures and from other things, could we, uh, given the amount of time these things are going to be um, in the environment, could we wait a year? Could we um, delay this, uh, you know, looking at different suppliers? And I, I would just be curious to, to understand better why we need to get these now given that length of service. I think I can handle that question. It's a good one, Commissioner Schmidt. Um, so we're trying to get five specialized pieces of equipment. And the reason for that is um, their average age is about 18 years old. And two or three of them were no longer allowed to get permitted because they don't meet the air quality standards. And so we're up against a deadline. And so as we um, replace them with the best available, I think there will be a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions just because um, it's new equipment built to a new standard. Um, but at this point, we're, we're pushed against the deadline to replace them so that we're compliant with the Air Board. All right, thank you. Thank you. And, and Commissioner Elkins. Yeah, kind of, I have a sort of a repeat of uh, Commissioner Evans' question about the tractor, and mine is regarding the um, the mower. Um, I similarly have Googled um, electric options for the, uh, the sports field mower, and there certainly are um, electric options available. Um, in fact, other cities in California have are presently using electric versions of um, this this uh, piece of equipment to maintain their uh, sports fields and their parklands. Um, can you explain to me why um, the it's, the chart states that electric options are not yet available? Yes, yeah, so, uh, similar to the other pieces of equipment, it's it's very specialized. So it's um it. There are electric lawnmowers out there. This is um, a specialized equipment that we use to maintain our sports fields. And when we did the research um, and called around different manufacturers, we didn't see anything that was comparable to what we're using now. Um, but if you have found something that you believe we should investigate further, um, please send it over and um, we can follow up. Well, tell me, did you look at the Evo, EVO uh, Mean Green 74 inch mower that actually is presently being used by the city of Torrance to maintain their baseball fields? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, the, the well, two, is, uh, so the question would be is it a real mower? Because that's what makes it um, a little more specialized. And if it is, wonderful. And um, we'll contact them and see if it's an option for us. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what a real mower is. It looks like a mower. Uh, it looks a lot like the one that I see in the presentation, only it's green. Um, I it think seems, it refers to having a cylinder cutting head. The real part, right? Um, and I, let me, let me just go to my page over here. Where I think I still have it. Um, and it does, not appear like it has that, that same cylinder um, function, but I, you know, I really would like, you know, if you haven't looked at it for you to at least look at it to determine whether it's not useful for that purpose, because I know that it is being used for that purpose in other cities. Um, uh, and it, it, uh, it's quite expensive. It's also $50,000. So I assume it's pretty functional. Um, and I, yeah, so anyway, that's my comment um, at this point. All right. So, so it sounds like uh, Mr. Henry is open to hearing suggestions for other sources for equipment and, and I'll 
just slot one quick thing in there. Uh, one piece of, of um, you know, an equipment list I saw recently was where Menlo Spark helped uh, Redwood Energy Partners develop a, a new retrofit guide for retrofitting commercial buildings to all electric. And in the back of that 120 or 130 page guide, it did have uh, quite a few electric alternatives like uh, electric um, uh, tractors and electric mowing machines, things like that for commercial or municipal operation. That might be another good source to look at where somebody has been trying to compile that type of information as well. Uh, and I, I'm sympathetic to the, you know, or agree with the same comment raised by Mr. Agassin, which is it, it makes sense on these pieces of equipment to see what we can do to not bring another one into existence that's of the combustion type and to see where we can, can bring into existence more of the electric types, regardless of the duration of our use for when, because these are long lived emitters, when we try to resell them, they go and emit some more elsewhere. Um, so, but now I'll, I'll step back into letting other commissioners share their questions and comments. Commission, uh, Vice Chair Headley. Thank you, Chair Cabot. Um, my question is going in a slightly different direction. It's regarding the charging infrastructure for the electric vehicles that, um, that we're planning to purchase. And I'm wondering if as part of the proposal that goes to city council, if we need to, um, I don't know, my sense is that we need to get our EV charging infrastructure going faster for both uh, the city fleet as well as, you know, more broadly, like for all the residents and people who visit Menlo Park. Um, so I guess I'm curious about the, the city fleet in particular, if we need to include something around speeding up the EV charging to make sure everything uh, works. Thank you. Okay, and do staff have any um, reply to that? Yeah, thank you, Chair Cabot. So we are working on a master plan for EV charging for the Civic Center and the Corp Yard. Um, and we have built in funding in the capital improvement plan to kind of go forward with that. Um, so we're, I'd say we're in the planning stage right now and trying to figure out, you know, how much do we need, what levels. We know that the police department needs higher levels of charging to have qu quicker charging and turnaround if they're using the same vehicle. Um, and also accessing incentives and other programs that are available. So it's, it's kind of putting the puzzle together over the next um, couple of months. And we hope to bring that forward um, once it's complete to the Environmental Quality Commission. So probably as soon as maybe like December or early um, 2023. Great. Thank you, Ms. Lucky. And Commissioner Evans. Thank you. Forgive me, I'm gonna have to push on the tractor again. <laughs> um, I guess what I'm trying to figure out, and thank you, Joanna, it sounds like you guys did look into that that one brand that I mentioned. Um, uh, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, um, it sounds like there, like, as I mentioned in my last comment, you know, just last month, um, California, it's called California Core, release this core voucher program and they're aver they're advertising it at least as California businesses and government agencies can apply for these incentives and then again there's two incentives through the California Air Resources Board to purchase um, clean tractors but if the technology really doesn't exist even for small cities like ours you know and I imagine that we have you know pro proportionally less turf space than other larger cities, perhaps, if that technology doesn't exist or, or isn't viable for Menlo Park, um, then it feels like there's a real mismatch between sort of the state and and um, Air Reese's board's movement to try to get municipalities to move in this direction and what, and what technology is available. Um, and so I wonder if it could be worth a call um, from from staff or, or from someone to give a call to these agencies or to give to give a call to the California core entity that's distributing this and ask them what 
you know, what kind of technology are cities applying for? Um, like, let's see what the other cities are, are getting. Um, I just, I can't help but wonder if there's got to be something out there that's viable for us if these kind of incentives exist around it. Otherwise, the incentives are not going to go anywhere. So forgive me for pushing on that one, but <laughs> I just, I guess I'm really just hoping we can find an electric tractor and that we could get it at a good price considering all these incentives that, that seem to exist and are relatively new. Yeah. I, I love your enthusiasm and I share that enthusiasm, <laughs> Commissioner Evans. And I'm just reading back uh, my notes uh, with my correspondence with that manufacturer. Um, and it looks like they're coming with more updated models in 2023. Um, and so hopefully by 2023, they'll have. Um, models that will fit our city operations, um, but I, I do I do understand about uh, calling up that uh, the core agency, and um, we'd be happy to look into that program a little bit further. I appreciate that, and I apologize that it's creating extra work for you. Um, and even if that one brand is delayed, you know, until 2023, I wonder what other technologies other cities are applying for. So I, I appreciate you looking into that and seeing if there is something that perhaps just isn't well advertised yet that may be available and viable for Menlo Park. Yep. Thank and, you. and thank you for for uh, agreeing to look further yes. into that. Um, before we leave the tractor topic, I'll just bring up one other idea to ask staff to consider. It sounds as though uh, staff has uh, three tractors already in the fleet and is looking to replace one, one fossil fired one with another fossil fired one. And uh, earlier I heard staff mentioned that some of the electric alternatives had a little less horsepower than the, the staff was uh, accustomed to. And so um, might it make sense to consider a, a putting into the fleet one of the uh, a diverse tractor that has a little bit less horsepower, if that's the issue, and it got around the emissions was an electric tractor and then see you know see how it performs and uh, you still have the other two uh, you know so it's it's not an, it doesn't feel like it needs to be an all or nothing decision about the whole fleet of three tractors at this point it it feels like it's about whether to um, create the manufacture of an electric one or create the manufacture of another fossil fired one So, so hopefully, staff will consider that comment, and uh, and I'll turn it back to uh, Commissioner Schmidt. Um, thanks, Chair Cabot, um, and and I think I I want to echo the themes of of Ole and and um, and everyone about just this idea of of um, not not getting anything uh, gas powered. Uh, not getting anything gas powered even built on the on the uh, because of the demand, and and maybe my my question um, builds off of uh, Brian's point about the end of life and the air board standards. I I wonder is if it's a reasonable request um, the staff on the pieces of equipment that we're proposing to put into service for fifteen or sixteen years. Uh, and actually, based on the fact that they were 18 years old, I mean, we could round that up to maybe two decades worth of burning fuel. Um, could we could we get a little more data on um, the estimated end of life of each of those pieces of equipment when we estimate they'll be violating the Air Board um, standards? Uh, and I'm just thinking it would be better to maybe ask for an exemption for a year and burn a little bit more at the current rate than 20 years of burning fuel. It's sort of like if we can if we can wait a year or two when the main driver is we're going to be violating airborne standards, I'd rather negotiate with them for a few pieces of equipment to to have exemptions than a gas burning piece of equipment into service for 20 years. So I, I 
I'm, I'm probably asking for maybe a little bit more data to help us understand, like, when are we going to be out of compliance? Do we have some options? Do we have any other options aside from putting these things into service for so long? And I'd just be curious about what people thought. Yeah, Jeff, you All right, thank you. And Commissioner Elkins. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo Chair Cabot's uh, comment about the um, possibility of, of finding something that might not be not quite as um, powerful as what um, the, the uh, uh, department is used to at this point in, um, in the balance of, um, of reducing emissions. Uh, for I know this came up with, in terms of gas leaf blowers, which um, really uh, have a, a maximum um, force of, of a, a small hurricane and is not even a necessary, um, necessary power level for our uses. Um, but I also wanted to ask the staff if they um, have contacted uh, the city of South Pasadena, which has um, converted its municipal operations to zero emissions at this point. Um, I don't, I'm not sure of the size of that city, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's at least the size of our city. Um, uh, and there are, I think there are other cities, but I know that that city in particular has um, already reached zero emissions in, in municipal operations uh, equipment. Has, did staff uh, possibly seek their advice on, on uh, equipment transitions? Commissioner Elkins, no, we haven't reached out to South Pasadena to see how they're replacing their specialized equipment, um, but we can. Okay, um, I can certainly formulate an email that I can send after this meeting that um, um, cites that that uh, one mower that I was discussing and then just uh, mentioned South Pasadena as well. Okay, thank you. I did try to send the, 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 the mower just now, but it bounced back. We must have some kind of a firewall that prevents mower manufacturers from spamming you. So I'll try to reformulate it so that gets past your filter. All right, thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, let's see, Vice Chair Headley. Thank you. Um, so when I read the staff report, it talked about renewable diesel. And somehow in my mind, like as I read about what that was, I didn't have as many concerns about this approach as what I'm hearing from my colleagues. And so I, I guess I want to bring up the question again, like what is this renewable diesel actually? And um, maybe get some answers from staff about that so that we can understand like maybe this is a much better alternative than we're currently worried about. So is, is staff able to describe the renewable diesel fuel they use and how much of it they use? Like what proportion is renewable diesel or what proportion is renewable? What proportion is fossil? Do they store it on site? Uh, those kind of things to help us understand how viable a fuel it is and how, how useful it is to you now. Sure. Yeah, so the renewable diesel is a product that um, we started purchasing about 18 months ago. And what's uh, kind of two highlights of it. Um, one is that it uh, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by up to 90% compared to traditional diesel. Uh, but another benefit is that it mixes in our underground storage tanks with traditional diesel. So we've switched over fully to um, the renewable diesel. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Commissioner Schmidt, your hand is still up. Do you have a, a question or comment? No, nope, my fault, just forgot to, to pull it down, thanks. Okay, See, I, I thought I'd um, uh, raise an issue or two or, or make an observation or two at this point. Um, thinking of the, uh, the two electric trail motorcycles that, um, are not appropriate for using for traffic enforcement. 
uh, that to me makes you know makes sense that trail motorcycles are not that useful for traffic enforcement, but the report tends to indicate it's because they're electric is the reason they're not useful for traffic enforcement. And I think it's not the electricness of them, but it is other features like the proprietary maintenance requirement. And so that proprietary word means the manufacturer insists on being the one who does maintenance or allows you to open certain components. And then also it sounds like there's a problem in that early generation of trail motorcycles is that the low voltage 12 volt system that's useful for traffic enforcement and other police activities for running the communication equipment, et cetera, that that 12 volt system is not being recharged from the major uh, battery of the, of the motorcycle. So they, it sounds like you're running into cases where you exhaust the 12 volt system. So it, so to me, this is not sounding like a problem with electric motorcycles. It's sounding like just a little design hiccups in early generation of electric trail motorcycles applied to traffic enforcement. And so as I look at that, I think, okay, it's fine for the city to rotate out the trail motorcycles from the fleet if they're not useful for what they're good at and to rotate in something that is useful for traffic enforcement. I, I've not looked at all at what's available in electric traffic enforcement motorcycles, but, but having read the staff report, I know those two features I'd love. <laughs> uh, Non-proprietary maintenance and the ability to keep a fully charged 12 volt system since our officers depend on that system for many of their functions. So. And I think it's, it's important for us to look at what it is we're trying to accomplish and to keep in mind, we're trying to accomplish not creating more fossil fired machines. Uh, and, uh, and I really do appreciate that, that uh, we're looking at you know, better performing fossil fired machines compared to poor performing ones. Uh, you know, the uh, Harley versus BMW and European higher standards for, emissions reductions, that kind of thing. That's important to me, but it's also important that we keep our eye on the ball and we not impugn electric machinery with uh, you know, just the results of early applications or misapplications of limited equipment, but that we keep trying and we look for ways to make space in our fleets for these attempts. And I'm, I'm definitely uh, uh, encouraged by Chief Norris's uh, mentioning that he, his officers are looking for the ways and, and um, encourage and want to find the ways to integrate the electric machines into their usage. I, I can imagine that will bring you know, air quality benefits and health benefits to the officers in close proximity to all that equipment. Uh, there are lots of times when I see vehicles idling and officers uh, doing their work near the vehicles working with with community members, uh, often down on the sidewalk or whatever, but uh, it'd be nice to not, you know, to be having electric vehicles <laughs> and not having everyone exposed to a lot of exhaust in those situations that are, are needed. So, so uh, you know, I'm getting a sense from a lot of the commission discussion that that uh, we're we're definitely interested in making sure that uh, council is presented with a full range of electric options for you know what they approve when staff looks for that and um, you know we're we're asking the bunch of tough questions to help staff see you know see ahead what I think council will be considering and that maybe this full range of options explored making sure you can find the things that can slot into your port into your fleets and portfolios of equipment. So, uh, thank you. And Commissioner Evans, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Commissioner Cabot. And oh, I just wanted to respond um, to Vice Chair Headley's thank you for that question about renewable diesel. I was just looking into it myself. And, and I think you're right. I mean, certainly it is a lower carbon fuel and there's, there's reasons to feel 
grateful for that. And, you know, my level of concern about this compared to how can we electrify the buildings in Menlo Park <laughs> is, is much, much lower. But so, you know, so my hope was just if, if there are these, if the technology already exists and the incentives in, exist at the state level and it's easier to swap in one for the other, we might as well do it. Um, um, but yes, uh, renewable diesel is certainly better than traditional, but it still does have carbon emissions. Thank you. Yeah, and, it, and it sounds like the uh, the underground tanks that now hold renewable diesel will you know still be useful for the remaining you know for remaining uh, renewable diesel fired equipment that Public Works does operate for several years into the future as they. They keep working on the transition, and we know it's not an all at once type of thing, but but uh, I, you know we're all feeling that crunch and knowing that transit the transition has to be underway full speed, and we think there are employee benefits to it of cleaner air for employees and and that and for community members exposed to all this. So we think there's some some big benefits in moving this direction. We know it's a different set of maintenance. I hear with passenger vehicles, it's less maintenance. Uh, I know it I know it when I take my Prius to the mechanic, I get dinged for having a gas engine and a battery. And so uh, you know going all electric would really reduce my maintenance bills. So so I definitely feel there's reasons to to uh, keep pushing further for how far we can get with um, the electrification of the vehicle fleet. Uh, th some of the things in the report, uh, you, you do have a gross total for costs of the vehicles, but there's uh, not any analysis comparing it to um, the cost of going again, re-upping on fossil fired equipment. So, you know, there, it, there might be a, an accident among the community where they mistakenly associate the million dollar cost with the cost of electrifying and that is not the that is not the cost of electrifying that is the cost of the electric things but we have no idea what the cost of the fossil fired things were and then we're not even looking at the cost of fuel each one and i know renewable diesel is not a low cost fuel and uh, we're not looking at the maintenance cost of them. So, so we haven't really given in that report that we haven't given the council any kind of a life cycle usage cost, or at least a, a city owned cycle usage cost for the say 15 years of usage on some equipment and five years on others. I think the report, if it could be, um, could be including that would help. Uh, it also might help to take a look at what are the miles per year or gallons per year used in the, the specific vehicles you're looking to roll out of the fleet, because I think some of them, you know, from my looks at other city fleet usage for uh, passenger type cars is one example I saw there. It was interesting in these little cities, we don't have a whole lot of miles on the staff passenger cars. You know, there just isn't that far to drive and there aren't that many occasions to drive. So it becomes easy to, to have them be, uh, you know, lower range vehicles and things like that. So I, I think if, you know, there's more data that can be prepared to help the council make their decision. And I, I encourage staff to, to see what they can do to put that together so council has plenty to look at. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Lucky. Yeah, if I may, Chair Kevin, yeah, those are great points. I just want to add a bit more context um, to comparing the gas to electric aspect of it. So, so if we kind of go um, back in time, uh, before we had our sustainable fleet policy, we had the environmental purchasing policy, where we did compare um, the cost, the upfront cost from gas to electric as well as the operation and maintenance cost over time. Um, and it, it does take quite a bit of um, staff work to, to run that, but you're correct. These are not incremental costs represented in the staff report. Like this is the difference between um, purchasing a gas to an electric vehicle. Um, but what we're um, essentially doing right now is looking at the EV first policy that the city council adopted through the sustainable fleet policy. So, I mean, we still adhere to, you know, the lowest and 
um, best value kind of electric vehicle, but really the direction that's been given is to purchase EVs first. We can do kind of some high level I mean, analysis on, I'm sure like the Department of Energy or some other um, resource has some good information about what the cost differentials are between gas to electric um, as, and operations and maintenance. And so we could um, dive a little bit deeper into that as well. But I just wanted to give kind of that context of, um, you know, why that's maybe not being as represented because we see gas as obsolete at this point and we're trying to, you know, move into the direction of all electric as a first priority. All right, thank you. Okay, are there any other commissioner comments or, or questions? All right, and is there a, a motion? Well, <laughs> it sounds like um, we are excited about the pieces in the step. I'm not gonna articulate it as it would be written, but I'm just see if we can work through the bullets here um, conceptually. It sounds like um, we are happy about the transitions from the gas powered vehicles to the electric ones um, that we understand the motorcycle transition, correct me if I'm wrong there, um, where most of the questions that, that I was hearing came up had to do with um, digging a bit deeper, um, calling uh, sample cities, the California core project and trying to figure out what that full range of electric options are for mowers, tractors, etc., cetera, and, and digging a little bit further to see what options may hopefully actually exist and getting those before council before um, moving to um, advise that we would, you know, approve uh, renewable diesel machines. Great, uh, thank you. And, and Commissioner Elkins. Thank you. Um, I was going to suggest that uh, to me, it sounds like we don't really, we've had our questions answered regarding the police vehicle requests um, and that maybe we could separate them out from the public works um, requests and go ahead and um, make a motion to um, make a recommendation to council regarding those vehicles that were requested by the police department um, and then uh, ask staff to to go back and provide some more data um, per our, our discussion um, regarding the other equipment. All right, that sounds like a motion. Is there a second? I, I'm Vice Chair Headley. Yes, I second the motion. All right, moved and seconded. And so uh, opening, opening it up for discussion. So it sounds like the motion was to um, recommend approval of the plan for new police vehicles and moving from the trail motorcycles to traffic enforcement motorcycles uh, as part of it, and a recommendation that staff look further into uh, possibilities of incorporating other alternative uh, public works machines into the proposal that they show to council. Okay, and uh, Commissioner Schmidt. Um, I thank you, Commissioner Elkins. I, I I was headed in the same direction with that, so I'm glad we broke those apart um, just as, a, as a first comment. And and I hope um, the the second thing about the uh, the second thing about the the equipment itself. You know, I I am feeling like given that the shelf life of that is quite long, or the the service life of that is quite long. Um, just trying to 
get a I'm not interested in necessarily um, seeing 7,000 options for those things. It's a little bit more about when, when really is the end of life? And if we delayed the purchase on three of these things for a year and a half, you know, what, what are the benefits? So it's a little, it's a little bit more of the timing that I think I'm, I'm hoping to see a little more data on when it comes to the equipment itself. Um, because, you know, my, my overarching question is, do we really need to have it this year? And if it's really the standards of the air quality board that's driving that decision, then it would feel like we'd have more alternatives. So it, for me, it's it's not necessarily trying to exhaustively look at every option on the on the market. It's a little bit more about do we have to do we have to buy everything right now and put it into service for 20 years? Could we could we look at alternatives for timing? Um, so that's just a little bit extra feedback on the kind of data and the kind of research that would be useful to, to see. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, those are good questions. You know, I, I kind of wonder, does the air quality district manage us uh, in this way as a fleet? And it sounds like our fleet emissions may have gone down by the transition to renewable diesel and does that then leave room to continue operating an older single machine within the fleet that um, you know you know may, may not pass today's standards for a new single machine because I'm not sure how retroactive these standards are to existing a piece, pieces of equipment uh, when it pertains to municipal fleets it's just a gap in my knowledge about how the air district goes about these things. I, I know for my car, it has to pass its uh, smog test for what it is. It does not have to match new cars, but it has to comply for what it is. Um, so, so I think there's, you know, what, it, what I'm sensing is we're, we're feeling like there's more information that may be useful for council when they consider staff's proposal about what to do with this uh, fleet modernization. And Commissioner Evans. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe there's like three bullets <laughs> then or three concepts within um, the piece about looking into alternatives for the electric uh, versus non electric um, public works equipment. Um, so one piece could be sort of the timing element. Do we have room to play there? Um, the second one could be checking in with the agencies in California, California Corps and the California Air Resources Board that are administering these incentives right now to find out from them what technology is qualifying and maybe that'll give us a heads up as to what kind of technology could work for our own city, checking that box. Um, and the third would be calling some cities like um, Commissioner Elkins recommended South Pasadena, there may have been mention of another one and just doing some research there to see what they used. I agree, we don't need a list of 7,000, but looking into those three different pieces might help us inform the decision. So timing, what are the agencies seeing and recommending? Um, and uh, what, what are some other major cities doing who have done it already? So, so those sound like uh, they're intended as friendly amendments. And, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and so, um, Commissioner Elkins, do you have a uh, response yeah. to those uh, yeah. amendments suggested? Sure. That I mean, I think that's just a um, um, formalization of the discussion that we've been having. Um, into the motion itself. So that's, I don't have an objection. All right, thank you. And um, Ms. Lucky, right above your cursor where it says gas powered, um, perhaps it would be combustion fired equipment because they, some of the equipment is not gas powered, it is uh, renewable diesel. Fossil fuel or or diesel or, or excuse me or renewable. See, combustion has to do with a you know burning a fuel, uh, which does create local pollutants, even if it's a renewable fuel. It still is producing nit nitrous oxides and and uh, 
particulate. Um, and Commissioner Schmidt. Um, thanks. Uh, and maybe one more data point just to build off of um, what Commissioner Evans was summarizing is um, it, it would just be good to know what penalties um, would occur. So let's let's say we are in violation for five pieces of equipment for a year. Is that, you know, is that a $50 penalty per, you know, is that a $50 penalty per piece of equipment? And if so, and I'm not taking into account the potential that these might break down, but let's say that our incentive is we don't want to be um, penalized by the air quality board. Uh, if that's a $50 fine, but it buys us a year to have a much better, if something's coming on the market that's much, much better and going to be in service for 20 years, um, that's the kind of that's the kind of trade-off I think we would want to um, at least have a little more data around. If it's a ten thousand dollar penalty per piece of equipment, that's a very, that's a very different discussion. So it would just be good to know um, what happens if these things fall out of standard. What happens to the city? What do we need to do? And and um, what can buy us a little more time to have better purchase options? Long term. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it sound, sounds like we're, you know, we're circling around and we're noticing, you know, there are ways we think staff can improve the uh, report and information provided to council so council can make a great decision about what to do th with this. Um, but, you know, while, while the motion has uh, in it the idea of, of approval of the police department's plan, I also wonder about, you know, those those couple of motorcycles and the same type of issue. What is what is the forecast of availability of electric traffic uh, enforcement motorcycles? Is I know nothing about it, so I don't know if they're imminent or if they look like uh, they're not going to happen for a number of years. And then, how does it compare to the the city's need? It sounds like the city is actually in need in that they're down to only three traffic cycles and they they need to replace uh, uh, two of them. So I think being able to, to try to have the staff show council the alternatives and what is the um, impact of, of going promptly and committing to combustion machines and what is the impact of trying to delay uh, and, and whether they look, whether they foresee that there's uh, electric vehicles coming that can meet their needs within a reasonable time period. And uh, Chief Norris. I... So just to uh, just to reinforce for you, uh, there currently are no alternatives that fit that uh, police traffic motorcycle uh, mode for us. Um, <clears throat> we can we could tell you that if there are no current available um, uh, items now that that fit that and they're we're not being told by any manufacturers hey just wait we have something coming which we're currently not being told that um that uh, that it's going to be at least probably a couple of years before we see something that's going to fit our needs and so you know that that's why i, I feel like and and i appreciate the fact that the that the commission is looking to um, the electrification option over, you know, combustion, um, gas combustion engine um, as, as a first choice. Uh, but I do see us being right now in a position with motorcycles similar to where we were when we started to transition to hybrid patrol cars. Uh, we have an available option that will give us a significant reduction in our carbon output at the, you know, at the police motorcycle level. We know that we are um, entering into an area where, where over the next couple of years, we're going to find some electric patrol cars that we're going to be able to find the right fit and start to transition through those. But the motorcycles are going to trail for a little bit. And it has to do with, um, I know, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, you, you uh, spoke a little bit about kind of the difference in the electrical um, uh, kind of uh, nervous system of these motorcycles and that being different 
uh, from that typical 12 volt system that's in cars. And that has a lot to do with it. Um, it has to do with, um, we can't just plug things in like we can, like with a typical uh, vehicle setup in a car, we can plug a lot of things in, including the lights and the radio and other, and other items, but we just don't have the ability to do that with motorcycles. And currently the technology is not in a place where, um, where, where we even can often run off of the same battery power for those peripheral items. And so we really need to see that technology improve in that part of the industry. And right now we're at a place where we're doing the best we can to be as, you know, as green forward as we can as a police department to try and to try and you know move in that direction while we're waiting for the opportunity to really um, you know explode that growth in the direction of electric vehicles. We as as I said, we have we have uh, our team is very excited about the idea of doing it when it's available to us, but right now it is just simply not. All right. Well, it, thank you for for that explanation. Um, and hopefully you understand the commission where we're really looking at how can this uh, staff report be improved so that it is an easy decision for council to make that they're seeing, you know, seeing the, you know, where, uh, what are the lines you have to stay between and what are the opportunities to make the most progress you can and that, that that's been met. So, so thanks for clarifying that for us. Um, and so, Back to looking at the motion. Any further comments on the motion? Uh, yes, Commissioner Evans. Um, thank you, Commissioner Elkins, for attempting to get that down on paper. Appreciate it. It's not always easy to take all of our complex comments and then boil it down. Um, I have a few tweaks to your last phrase. Um, um, and, and forgive me, I can be nitpicky when it comes to this kind of stuff, so bear with me. Um, such as, um, as a, other local government examples, um, can we, could we say something more like, um, um, other cities who are employing electric options successfully or something like that to, to be to be specific um, there. Just to clarify, Commissioner Evans, this is uh, sustainability manager Lecky who's writing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Lecky. No worries. Okay, uh, <laughs> such as other cities that are deploying electric um public works alternatives yeah. alternatives successfully um thank you and then um oh oh wait okay Okay, thank you. And then um checking with the state for options um I I, I might say you guys, come in and, and and critique this if you want. I don't have to be the one who's saying how this is be written, but um, being specific in saying, um, checking with the relevant agencies that are provide, well, here, I'm gonna say what I mean. Checking with the agencies that are providing the incentives to see what kinds of technologies um, they know are available for cities. And specifically, you know, if you want to put in parentheses, California Core and the California Air Resources Board are the two entities that I read that are providing incentives, at least for electric tractors. So I don't know if we want to put those agencies in parentheses. Is that how you um, represent California Core? It is. That's what I saw on that one electric tractor site. And then the last one, um, Commissioner uh, Schmidt, you might have a way to wordsmith the, the timing piece that you wanted to include. That was the last piece to include there in that phrase. Hmm. <clears throat> um, sorry, I tricked me. And maybe 
something along the lines of and their timing related to relevant replacement technologies or something like that. Is it timing uh, I, I in think relation to requirements timing. and end of life? Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the city's requirements that are forcing the city to act to get some machine. Well, I mean, the the objective is right. We're trying to see if there's if there's timing wiggle room that would enable us to get a better piece of equipment that's manufactured, say, next year. Right. That's what we're we're trying to capture. Right. Yeah, because I think the 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 concern is that the longer term damage yeah. of having a piece of equipment in service for a longer period of time is the longer term damage is greater than you know, maybe if we just waited six months, um, and I, you know, I know how research is, it can be very point in time, but also look forward a little bit. So I think that's what I was trying to articulate pretty inarticulately was, um, it's the longer term damage that I'm more concerned about if we just waited. Yeah, that so, totally makes so sense I'm, to me. I'm just trying to figure sorry. out how to capture it. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, so I'm hoping, you know, staff is hearing this discussion and, and seeing what it makes sense to write in their in their staff report to council so council sees these issues considered and and where staff's recommendation stands compared to it so so i think you know the things we're discussing should be helping staff you know make a great staff report that that covers all kinds of, of areas and uh, allows council an easy decision and but i see a hand raised by commissioner elkins I agree with that, uh, Chair Cabot. I, I was going to throw in there, since it looked like we were throwing everything else in, um, about um, putting in a comparison of what it would have cost if we just bought all brand new gas equipment. Um, but I'm happy if staff just um, does that. We don't need to put in the motion. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I'm thinking. Is, is staff's hearing this. I hope they do these things, but uh, I don't know how much has to be in a motion. Um, yeah. If I may, Chair Cabot, I, yeah, I, I think, and I've taken down some notes as well as part of our minute taking. Um, so that'll be helpful for staff to kind of revisit some of the main points of discussion. Um, but I do want to check in with um, Brian, Joanna, as well to make sure they understand kind of um, these other elements in earth, they need further clarification. Hey, Miss Lucky. Yes, I think this is uh, really productive feedback. Um, so everything that's listed in the action right now, we can follow through on for the public works equipment. Great. I have a question, um, Commissioner Cabot and Commissioner Elkins. Yes. Are we are we are we actually recommending that staff do a quantitative analysis of what the cost would have been with the gas fired power or, or do we simply want them to just sort of qualitatively say or qualitatively point out to council in their staff report that you know know the to know and explain what those costs are so that we don't scare yep. council into thinking that this is like a really high cost of electrification yeah my um, my opinion is that staff yeah. should take that easier lighter route and write uh, the words about it as opposed to do a in-depth analysis of the costs yeah. because as they pointed out they have an electric first policy already so exactly they're, they're following that but but some you know some <laughs> uh, sentence or two that help the public understand this million dollar number is not the cost of electrification this is the cost of having equipment meet the city's needs and you know probably some little part of it either positive or negative is part of the million um it, uh, see there's also i just see in the middle of the paragraph there's an apostrophe in the word works that i don't know is needed um I pointed that out only because um, wonderful public works staffs. I was trying to save you guys from having to do a lot of um, deep analysis on costs if if the qualitative explanation explanation would suffice. Because <laughs> I know um, uh, 
Ms. Lucky mentioned that that's, you know, it's in a lot of in-depth analysis and I don't think that's what we were right. recommending. And we're, yeah, we're definitely not trying to create uh, <laughs> uh, extra work for staff. We're, we're just trying to make sure alternatives are carefully explored and explained to council so council is able to reach a quick conclusion. All right. Um, so I think the other, oh, sorry. Yeah, any other adjustments people would like to ask uh, the motion makers for? So are we just going to put a period at the end of equipment and then I think that captures it. The last one might be hard for someone who wasn't listening to the meeting to understand, but I think <laughs> um, it's more important that public works understand and I would imagine that they do. <laughs> All right, and so hearing no other comments, um, can we put this to a vote? Thank you, Chair Cabot. So I will take roll call and you can um, say yes or no. Commissioner Elkins? Yes. Commissioner Evans? Yes. Vice Chair Headley? Yes. Chair Cabot? Yes. Commissioner Lynn? Yes. And Commissioner Schmidt. Yes. A motion passes. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. And now we move to the uh, next item on our regular business. It is a an information report by the out the um, EQC Environmental Quality Commission Outreach Subcommittee uh, to the full committee sharing the. Um, Kind of the, the document or slide deck and some explanation of, of what it is and allowing comments by the commission on it and also allowing public comments as well, I believe. So, uh, let's see. Uh, and then Vice Chair Headley is the chair of our outreach subcommittee. And so you can uh, lead off. Great. Um... Ms. Lucky, should I share my slides or do you want to drive the slide situation? Yes, I can I can drive the, the slides. Okay. Let me great. just get myself Thank you. situated a little bit here. No problem. And, and also noting the, the time. Um, we, we usually try to conclude somewhat close to 8 p.m. So, so if time can be budgeted, we can move through. Yes, thank you for that reminder, um, Chair Cabot. And maybe what I'll say is, um, you, you know, my email address is available online. So if you have any additional feedback that we don't get to discuss, I welcome that uh, feedback that way as well. All right, so our subcommittee has been busy since our last EQC meeting. Next slide, please. Um, the subcommittee is uh, Jeff Schmidt, myself, uh, Tom Cabot, and uh, Marlon Santoyo of Menlo Spark has been a really integral part of this um, process as well, and including uh, Diane Bailey. All right, next slide. All right, so we have identified the, the goals, the things, the primary things that we want to focus on, which are listed there. And critically, we've clarified the messaging for these kickoff meetings. So the overall intent is to essentially have regular, we're calling them community collaboration sessions. We're imagining monthly-ish, uh, going out to the community, uh, talking about different topics related to climate preservation, um, and inviting other uh, community leaders and nonprofits to also be a part of this presentation. We're not going to be presenting all of them ourselves but have a regular series of ways to engage with the public to both share information and to get information from them about what they would like to see. And then we'll consolidate that information and be able to share it with staff and with council. Um, so in that, we've identified a few, a few key partners and nonprofits that we're gonna be collaborating with, and that's going really well. And very excitingly, we've, um, we're going to be hosting our two kickoff meetings in 
September. Uh, we have dates September 13th at the um, Bell, sorry, at the Bellhaven Branch Library and September 14th at the Menlo Park Library, both days 6 to 7 p.m. And information about those are going to be, you know, going out to the, um, you know, in various forms. So I would invite you all to come and be a part of the conversation, bring a couple of friends, and I'll uh, maybe go on to the next slides and share what we are planning to share with everyone. All right, next slide, please. All right, so this is our agenda, but let's go next slide. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the, the first thing here is, you know, the climate is changing, burning fossil fuel is a problem. Um, and there's a whole bunch of impacts that we're seeing in our own personal lives, as well as around the world, um, including, you know, health and safety and, you know, flooding and wildfires and all this. So this is, you know, as we know, like a very large problem. And um, next slide, please. Can cause, um, you know, there's a new term for it that we're probably all familiar with, uh, eco-anxiety, this feeling of like dread and helplessness around all of the um the things that are changing in the world. But I guess my experience with anxiety and you know what I've read about it is there's like getting into action can help us collectively um, both solve the problem as well as move out of this sense of paralysis that can sometimes happen. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so the three key pieces that we want to highlight are like having a vision is essential, having clear actions that we can take is essential and then collaboration. So that's essentially how the rest of the slides kind of play out. So we have this incredible um, vision that's been built over time by everyone who's been involved with Menlo Park. And we have quotes here from uh, Josh Becker and uh, Betsy Nash. Thank you to you both for contributing to those. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we also have the, the tailwinds of recent, like really positive leg legislation happening at the state and national level. Um, and we, I think we get to add some more information here about the, the news around electric vehicles coming out of California. So we can update that. Next slide, please. And, um, but even prior to that, you know, what we really want to help people understand is what Menlo Park has been doing for a whole number of years. So we want to highlight uh, the Menlo Park's climate goal to be zero carbon by 2030 and how we want to do that through reducing carbon dioxide um, emissions and then uh, through this 10% CO2 removal of the sequestration efforts. So that, I'm trying to remember exactly when that was, but I have it in the notes, but that was, this goal was created at least like three years ago, I believe. Next slide, please. And then out of the goal, this very specific climate action plan that, you know, I didn't really know about before I became a commissioner. So I'm assuming the general public doesn't really know. So we want to highlight that these are the six key things that were, um, were initially agreed upon to, to focus on. And in particular, there's uh, funding and staff uh, effort particularly focused on one, three, and five right now. But we also want to say that, you know, like while these six things are really important. They are just the starting point for deeper change. Next slide, please. And well, here's a whole bunch of things that Menlo Park has been doing over many years to move toward this climate action plan. Because I guess maybe the important thing is here is Menlo Park adopted its first climate action plan way back in 2009, updated it a couple of years ago, and has been doing a lot of work. So we really want to celebrate this because Menlo Park has been a leader in the climate space and has been inspiring other cities around the, the Bay Area as well as the state and beyond. So there's a lot to be proud of. And I, I know I hear, you know, when we come to these meetings, like a, a pride in being a leader and a center of innovation. So we wanna continue that, hopefully. Next slide, please. All right, so moving into action, the next few slides, please continue. Focus on actions. Oh, wait, can you make that bigger? Because the right side of this slide is like the really important one. Or make it smaller so we can see it. Thanks, Rebecca. Sorry. Okay, okay. So um, this one helps everyone understand 
what a safe climate is. So we have like no temperature rise from pre-industrial levels is that green thing at the bottom. We're not there anymore. We're at this 1.3 degrees Celsius above really what is safe. So you can see like along the right hand side is what we're anticipating climate damage to be at various um, temperature rise levels. So we have, I mean, obviously we want to keep this as low as possible to, you know, mitigate and reverse all of the, the you know, horrific situations we've been seeing. But we have the 1.5 degree um, Celsius Paris Accord target, and then the limit at two degrees Celsius. But you can see it, if we get to two degrees Celsius, the situation with the environment is um, expected to be four times worse than it is now. So it's the multiplier, um, which is, you know, quite problematic. So this is why, uh, well, we'll just make sure everyone understands that this is why we want to move uh, so quickly and aggressively around reducing uh, carbon emissions. Next slide, please. All right, so the next few slides go into specific actions people can take um, now to help move forward on, you know, the cap uh, actions, numbers one, two, three, four, and five. So you can, we'll go through these quickly. Next slide, please. So cap actions one, two, three, and four are things people can do um, right away. Um, and then numbers five and six, next slide, please are focused on what this city primarily is um, doing. All right, next slide. Is also how people can get involved in other ways around policy, um, participation, and taking part in various programs that are available to support this transition that we're in. All right, next slide. So the last piece is this collaboration idea. We really want to get feedback from the community about how they're seeing things um, because we have brilliant people uh, within Menlo Park and we would love to tap into their ideas. Next slide. We have a couple of inspirational quotes here about uh, how change happens and why we need to do this work. Next slide. So the next few slides here will not really be slides, but more a... Um, a survey. So the people who come, we want to actually ask for their feedback on, I think we have five questions here. So the first one is, how important to you is the issue of climate change? And then, you know, why in various ways. Next slide. And then we want to ask about people's um, motivation and likelihood to make changes. Next slide, please. And then we want to provide um, input to the city council around how people, how fast people feel like we should move. Like, should we go fast enough to meet the Paris Accord target or the limit or, you know, really go slowly and not do anything other than what we're doing? And then there's some open space there for what else they would like to see us do. And next slide, please. With our intention to hold monthly-ish community collaboration sessions, we want to get feedback from people on what they want to hear about. So this is an opportunity for people to share. And once we do all that survey, next slide, please. Oh, we want to get some demographics. Next slide. Um, we'll really be opening it up for dialogue and to hear what people have to say beyond just the survey. Um, so I believe, oh, one more slide. And then we've, you know, got all these resources that we'll, you know, make sure people know about, you know, flyers and handouts and an opportunity for key, you know, nonprofits who are working in this space to, um, you know, pass out information about what they're offering to help people make this transition. So that is essentially uh, the plan for the very first, these, this kickoff couple of meetings that are scheduled for mid-September. Um, we would love uh, feedback from all of you on this. Does it seem like we're headed in the right direction, et cetera? But I guess maybe it's time for clarifying comments. Is that right? Yeah, so, so uh, first off, are there any clarifying comments before we allow public comment? Or clarifying questions, I mean, about what was just shown? Okay, and seeing none, then, uh, Rebecca, can we call for any public comment opportunity? 
Thank you, Chair Cabot. So at this time, if you would like to speak on the informational item regarding public education outreach, please use your raised hand feature that's next to your name or at the bottom of the screen. If you're on a landline or a cell phone, you can press star nine and I'll be able to unmute your microphone for you. At this time, I do not see any hands raised. I return the meeting back to you, Chair Cabot. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. And so now any uh, commissioner discussion or comments or questions about the, uh, the, the presentation packet that was essentially prepared for the opening meeting or two meetings of the series and then more topic specific uh, packets will be prepared for follow on meetings as, as it goes uh, into more details about uh, actions that, that are involved in the city's climate action plan. But uh, so any comments on uh, this deck or suggestions? Uh, yes, Commissioner Elkins. Uh, congratulations, I thought that was great. Uh, you obviously put a lot into it and I'm really excited to see that this kind of um, outreach is starting to happen. I think uh, it's uh, not too soon because I see a lot of resistance um, on social media and it seems, um, in, uh, inscrutable to me why people are so uh, resistant. So uh, do you have any um, ideas about how to, to reach out to those people who, who seem most uh, um, opposed to doing anything about this? So I assume that they are probably not going to come to the meetings unless they're um, quite angry. <laughs> so, um, that's my that's my first question. Can I respond to that? Uh, sure. Well, um, one of the things we're trying to do with these sessions is to reach the silent majority of people who are actually supportive of taking action. So the invitation for all of us is how do we reach out to our you know friends and family and neighbors to invite them to be a part of this conversation. So that's one piece, because I don't know if we're ever going to change those people's minds. The other piece is there was some research that was shown around, like, what is the tipping point of how many people you need on board to make a change happen? And I can dig it up, but they were kind of like, don't focus about on the people who are the naysayers, because if we can get, you know, it's like 30% of the people like, yes, let's do it. It's going to be enough to pull everybody else along. So that's my view on it. I'm open to hearing other views if we need to engage more directly with people who are not ready to make shifts. I'm happy to consider that as well. Thank you for the question, Commissioner Elkins. All right, and Commissioner Evans. I just wanted to say thank you to you guys, uh, to the Climate Outreach Subcommittee. This was obviously a non negligible amount of work as it will be going forward and just so thank you for creating terrific slides and putting all of that hard work into that presentation deck and then you know being willing to do the outreach meetings themselves so thanks i appreciate it right and commissioner schmidt um yeah just just maybe one thing to to add as well to, or maybe one and a half things to add um the, the the name and the spirit behind the collaboration stuff I think is really important to emphasize because it it really speaks to this idea of <clears throat> if you've got one person who's really resistant but you've got 150 people who are really activated that's what we're trying to achieve I think and so this isn't necessarily going to be an EQC led tops down we present every single time we'll pull in Diane to present um, for Menlo Spark and talk about a different piece of work or, um, you know, uh, Canopy to talk about uh, tree planting and, and or Actera and Lauren to talk about um, some of the initiatives that they have. So the, the hope, I, I want to <clears throat> emphasize that although we're kind of prompting this as commissioners, it's really a citizen-driven 
citizen led way to activate more people to get involved in lots of activities um, and recognizing that what the city does is not the only thing that is happening. It's super important, but this, this community of nonprofits are doing so much. So it's, it's opening this platform to say, let's get people to attend these things. Let, let's have other people lead the discussion. And then the, the other thing I wanted to say um, about it is treating it as a discussion. So although um, uh, Vice Chair Headley went through the slides and it maybe felt kind of top down, I think our hope over time is the slides are just a prompt for deeper discussions. And, and that's not just um, a nice thing to say because I think a part of our value is, um, well, I remember in corporate life, I was, I was a member of companies for a long time and work with CEOs. And the most valuable thing when you consult with leaders sometimes is, here's what I'm hearing on the street. This is what I'm hearing from the average person that you don't have access to, or you don't talk to very often. So our, our hope is through this survey and through this open dialogue, we can represent back to city council in a much more powerful, incredible way. The voice of what we're hearing in all these meetings, not, not only when we're the presenters, but when um, Canopy is presenting or Actera or Menlo Spark, or we just, we, we can collectivize the voice much more effectively through this stuff. So I, I just wanted to tease those points out because it might feel like this is a very EQC driven thing. And that's really to get the boat launched but our hope is that once the boat is launched, it becomes a community-based thing. So anyway, just wanted to add that to the discussion. All right, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, one thing I, I recall also we talked about in the subcommittee was having room for staff to the extent staff is interested in uh, making presentations of the whole thing or parts of it, there's room for that to happen. Um, we're essentially just trying to get the ball rolling, as you say, and and um, start those community conversations and see what what uh, we as individuals are able to do. And there's room for other commissioners to also make presentations uh, with this deck or as parts of it. Um, so so lots of room, but it's it's just a starting tool to get conversations going in the community so that that outreach can happen and uh, progress can be made. And Commissioner Elkins. Thank you. I just wanted to um, to agree with um, what you said at first to uh, um, Commissioner Schmidt about it being a, a collaborative, the importance of it being approached as a collaboration and as a citizen run um, idea because a lot of the opposition that I see seems to come from uh, emotional reaction of um, not wanting to be told what to do and not having government impose um, things on people. And so if we, can, if we can get people to feel like they're part of the process, um, I think that would be really valuable. Yes, and uh, Vice Chair Headley. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for all of your comments. I had, you know, an additional thought about the people who are resistant to making changes. Like, I get it. Um, and part of this dialogue is, like, for me personally, I really want to understand what are the concerns that people have. Like, I know as I'm trying to electrify my house, I'm running into barriers. And if we can understand what those barriers are, either like physical barriers or emotional or mental barriers, we can figure out what we can do to support people in moving um, through them, around them, et cetera. Um, so I, I guess I don't, I guess back to um, uh, Commissioner Elkin's initial point, like what are we gonna do? Like my, my hope is that we can really engage people and talk about what the concerns are that they actually have and hopefully um, come up with some better solutions. Cause I guess I found in my work with, you know, my, my non EQC work is when I get the feedback, like the, the concerns that people have, like usually there's something real there that needs to be addressed. So to the extent that we can really hear those concerns and try to find a creative solution, I think it'll be good for everybody. All right, thank you. And uh, yes, Commissioner Schmidt. 
Um, I, I definitely want to echo what um, what's being said. The the other thing I would um, maybe ask the, um, the group to think about is we're, we're very much treating this like a network effect kind of a, a thing. So, so the nonprofits that we're working with, we're asking them to forward the invitations to their networks um, because we, you know, it's it's pretty tough to figure out like how do you reach the average citizen? How do you? I don't have a mailing list of five thousand Menlo Park citizens, right? And I, I don't know that anybody really does. So, so we're trying to treat this um, as a way to engage people, you know, in six degrees of, of of Kevin Bacon. You know, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody. And and if those people are part of meetings, it it makes things feel much more inclusive. So, I, I want to I wanted to mention that and also say um, we do have the invitations and the uh, materials. So um, Vice Chair Headley presented the the deck, but we are literally kind of actively getting this out through the pipes right now to try to get as many folks as we can to the first meeting on the 13th and the 14th. Um, so if the commission would be willing to share that with your network, share that with your nonprofit friends. We're happy to let you know who we've already shared it with. There's about 14 uh, organizations that have um, agreed to help us get the word out at, uh, and uh, or partners and uh, partners and organizations. But we are trying to get a pretty big kind of kickoff push with this through the network that we're, we're building. And then hopefully every month that network continues to, to grow. So we do reach a lot more people and we can activate that silent majority. So just wanted to promote the network effects and that we're we're actively doing that right now for the for the kickoff. So thank you. All right. Thank you. And Commissioner Elkins. Oh here I am again. I've <laughs> I keep raising my hand because I keep thinking of things. Um, and one of them is what about uh, Spanish language um, interpretation for these meetings? Is that something that you've considered or hope for? Yes. Right. Yes. So the team's been looking at that too. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank well, you. It's, it's, yeah, it's great to hear uh, this feedback and ideas. And I know, you know, more ideas may occur to you, but since the subcommittee has three members on it, the way to put your ideas out, I believe, will, would be to send them to Rebecca and she would send them to uh, the subcommittee or uh, you know, I think she's able to send them to the subcommittee or maybe it's the whole commission, but um, that'd be the way to, to you know, keep adding ideas as you get them. And then also uh, I believe the subcommittee is making the deck available to commissioners too. If you, you know, want to use it to do a presentation or coordinate with the committee, um, let's do that and, and see how to get this uh, type of outreach going to many more networks so that many more people uh, can share their ideas about what progress needs to be made or stopped. So, Great. Thank you. Congratulations and, and thank you again. Yeah, thank yeah, definitely my thanks go out to the strong teammates and uh, all their coordinating. I was able to just coast along and, and uh, uh, watch it all happen. So that concludes that business item and we are up to uh, reports of officials. Do uh, sustainability manager Lucky, do we have any reports from staff? Thank you, Chair Cabot, and thank you to the outreach subcommittee. This is very exciting. Um, and I will always gently remind all of you um, when you're out there presenting to try to kind of express um, the presentation as you know a, a citizen, but you can certainly say that you serve on the commission and just to be careful that no more than four or three, I'm sorry, are at a, yes, thank you. Oh, you guys are on it. So that was a test <laughs> or at, um, at a, a community meeting. Otherwise, it's considered a, a meeting and we need to post an agenda and there's some protocols. So, it, I mean, if you do want to do that, it's it's possible. We just need to go through a few checkpoints to make that happen. Um, and so related to that, so I, I am in contact and Ori as well with the outreach um, 
subcommittee, and just kind of looking at ways where um, the city can collaborate on efforts or support efforts. So we'll probably have a little bit more information on that at the next meeting, um, or certainly by November uh, or October. I'm jumping a month here. And I do have an update about um, existing building electrification permits. So the city council on August 23rd did approve to waive permit fees for when the scope of work is limited to um, changing out a, um, a gas, natural gas equipment to electric. And if a project involves a larger scope, maybe you're doing a kitchen remodel or a bathroom remodel and you're also electrifying, then a credit would be applied to your permit depending on how many pieces of equipment you are converting to electric. So that was really great. I know the commission has um, asked about this and, and members of the public. And so the city council is supportive um, of the measure. They did ask to track and monitor kind of the um, the cost of, of, of the waiver program or the credit program. So I'm working over the next month with the building division in finance on how to track that. Um, and it is, um, we have made it effective immediately because of course we know people are expecting it to um, be in place already. Um, so, um, there, so that's definitely available now to um, all um, building permit applicants in Menlo Park. And oh, congratulations to <laughs> staff and council for making that uh, that very nice change. And so that that definitely is is a signal to the community of the direction where we want to be headed if we're going to be getting on target to meet the unanimously approved 2020 climate action plan. Agreed. Thank you so much. And thank you as well. I couldn't do a lot of this without um, support of a strong community. And so the other thing I have to report on too is uh, we, we typically um, have solid waste billing inserts that go out every quarter. And so the next billing cycle is between October and December. So I've been looking at kind of what we could promote and uh, we're promoting quite a few of the Peninsula Clean Energy incentives. So like the rebate um, has been increased for from Peninsula Clean Energy for water, um, water heating heat pumps. <laughs> and um, solar battery storage is another um, great item that we're informing folks about. And I think there's also a rebate for recycling your refrigerator or air conditioning equipment to $50. So we're just letting people know it's out there. And also for um, used EV electric vehicles, there's a up to $6,000 rebate available from Peninsula Clean Energy, as well as a, an incentive um, now available through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, for for new vehicles as well as used vehicles. So there's definitely a lot of incentives um, that we're all going through. I know um, there's a lot of people in our influence circle that are keeping track of that. So I'm sure we'll probably um, kind of all of the commissioners on what that means kind of going forward um, if you don't already know. And then ORI does continue to make really significant um, progress on decarbonizing our city operations. So looking at um, uh, changing out our, our natural gas water heating equipment with electric versions and finding really great incentive programs um, to help make that happen. So I'm sure he'll update you when he returns um, at the next EQC meeting on that front. And, and um, I think there are even incentives in the new IRA that mm -hmm. are Pay out incentives to non-taxable entities like local mm. government. So yeah, so thirty percent, uh, which yeah, which raises kind of the issue too about the the timing of your bill stuffers. You say September, October is the yes. timing of when you'll you'll be putting that out, and then um, the IRA already changed the tax credits on solar and batteries, and I believe heat pumps for tax credits. 
And, but then a lot of other things change starting January 1st next year. Right. And then it takes a little while for the state to stand up a program that helps feeding the money back. The upfront incentives may be delayed a year while the state uh, organizes its state machinery to, to send the money back. But the basic idea is uh, uh, customers, households say under their the uh, uh, low income threshold would end up with uh, climate savings accounts of $14,000 each. And then households like mine under $300,000 income would have a $7,000 account established for us that we can draw upon as we do these electrification projects. And that's a whole new complex, interesting arrangement, but it's, it's not effective these months, it's effective starting January 1st. And so, it, you know, one thing to think about is, is in your bill stuffers, don't get everyone thinking the incentives are only low because they're about to change and be high. There are large tailwinds being created by the, the recently enacted IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, that have really changed the economics of electrification and made it uh, much more uh, lucrative here. So it was, it was always viable, now it's lucrative. Somebody will help pay for it. Yeah, I appreciate that, Chair Cabot. Um, and yes, can look into that a little bit more. The timing is pretty tight to get through all of the checkpoints um, to, to get to publishing. And we'll definitely have probably the next one due by the end of December that would go out for January, February, March. Um, so then there's another opportunity to let people know that they have increased. So if you... <laughs> We're still on the fence about it. You can keep going, but yeah, recognize that there could be potential opportunity um, uh, incentives there if they maybe wait. Do does the outreach committee have an interest in in advertising your outreach meetings on one of these pieces? Yeah, yes, that's that's uh, we we have been looking at a schedule of different topics to roll out at different times, and you're. You're spot on. That's one of the things that would be rolling out uh, as we get closer to the end of the year, trying to help people prepare. So they only have to learn one system. <laughs> It'll be the new system that's that's uh, big. And and uh, also the IRA has that system last for 10 years. So it's kind of an interesting thing. We've never had stability out of the federal government before. So that's a whole new uh, nice thing. I'm sorry, That's Rebecca, I, I cut you off. So, no. um, so uh, I think that covers most of my updates. There's a lot of things simmering right now. So hopefully I'll have more to report on next month as well. All right, thank you very much. Do commissioners have uh, reports of activities or uh, information they'd like to share with the commission? Okay, well, seeing none, I think we can adjourn tonight's meeting. Uh, thank you all so much for, for all this good uh, discussion and progress and advice provided. I, I think uh, we're doing a good job and I'm, I'm glad we're, we're working on this together. Thanks so much and I look forward to our next meeting. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Good night. Ciao. Good night. Good night.